Representative Gatine. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to move this bill on to pass. Second. Moved by Representative Gatine, seconded by Representative uh, Sanderson, ought to pass. Any discussion on the pending motion? Seeing no discussion, then without objection, we'll move to a vote. All in favor of the motion ought to pass. Please raise your hand. All opposed? I wasn't ready yet. Oh. Everybody All right. All, 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 all in favor. I'm sorry. It wasn't you. No, it wasn't. So, so all in favor, put your hand up. <coughs>
266, um, again, an act to allow access for law enforcement officers to the list of registered primary caregivers for medical marijuana patients. This bill permits the disclosure of the Department of Health and Human Services list of registered caregivers for medical marijuana patients in a law enforcement official's jurisdiction to allow the law enforcement official to rule out a registered primary caregiver when verifying reports of criminal activity. Uh, and if you turn to page 19 of the um, engrossed packet, you can see that this language is included um, in the, towards the bottom of page 19, and this is under the registry identification card section and the subsection dealing with um, confidentiality. And so that, that section would now read, um, and it's subsection, or it's paragraph G, records maintained by the department pursuant to this chapter that identify applicants for a registry identification card, registered patients, registered primary caregivers, and registered patients, medical providers, are confidential and may not be disclosed except as provided in this subsection and as follows. And then if you go down to um, part five, it reads, to a law enforcement official for verification purposes, the records may not be disclosed further than necessary to achieve the limited goals of a specific investigation and then the new language adds, except that a list of the registered primary caregivers in a law enforcement official's jurisdiction may be disclosed to assist the law enforcement official in ruling out a caregiver when verifying reports of criminal activity. Um, so that is the, the change that's made there. And I wanted to, um, and, and if at any point the committee would like me to summarize the testimony from, from that bill, I'd be happy to do that. That's provided in the Salmon Packet. But one thing I wanted to point out on page three of the Salmon Packet was that there was a request made by the sponsor during the public hearing, and he stated, I respectfully request that the committee direct the department through this legislation or a formal letter to respond to any and all legitimate law enforcement inquiries about the status of a registered patient. Uh, within a 24-hour time period. Um, so that, that was the request that was made by the sponsor at the public hearing, and so I wanted the committee to be aware of that. As they Discussion? Say, so, yeah, I, I know um, I appreciate the place of concern that the, I think the legislator's intent is coming from on this. Um, I don't necessarily know if this is the right way to accomplish it, but I know, you know, I, I, I know of cases where, you know, there have been questions about whether or not some, uh, you know, someone who's operating is actually operating as a legally registered caregiver. I, I, yeah, I know of questions that have even occurred in the district where um, lack of access to that information created suspicions unnecessarily. Um, that being said, I don't know that this is the right way to do it. I've, but I believe the the sponsor has so the representative Hyman, someone would you like to speak yeah. to that? Thank you. So this is in my came from my district and, and we have had conversations back and forth about this. And knowing that it is accessible to them, I, the police chief from York, where this problem arose, feels comfortable with the, the access to the information. Um, what, but would request that there's a 24-hour um, period um, to gather the, the, the information. So uh, even a strong letter, um, not not to pass with a strong letter, would be okay in absence of a 24-hour. So, so, so whatever we want to think about that is. So that would be a letter requesting that the department respond within 24 hours to request for the registration status of individual caregivers upon request? That's, yes, that, that's already there. That information is already accessible okay. to them. But, and they feel comfortable accessing it. They okay. just want to be able to know that there's a quick turnaround time and a strong letter. Okay. okay, great. Representative Sanderson. The only problem I could see with that, and I think we would need to accommodate for that, is we can So on business days. Okay. All right. Um, then, hearing that, if, unless there's any additional discussion, I'll enter, entertain.
entertain a motion. Concerning that that person, 
or to the extent they can effectively manage or apply that individual's estate to necessary ends. And the concern for me is that this may be a population that is easily exploited. And I have some concerns about uh, what those individuals might face. Can we, we danger from uh, Hillary Lister? Um, so I, I raise that as a, uh, you know, something that I'd like to have, have thought through as the committee goes forward. I don't know that I need more information, but maybe someone can help us. Good afternoon. Um, so just addressing some of those concerns, because I definitely do recognize that it's a population of people that could face exploitation. <coughs> And I don't know if there could be some language added to specify maybe if it was in conjunction with their caregiver or their legal guardian. <clears throat> I'm my mother's legal guardian. She is an incapacitated adult. Yeah, I would lose my guardianship if I did something to put her at risk like that, that potentially, if I was putting her in a dangerous situation or doing a legal activity. But it is a situation where as a guardian, you can't necessarily be there full time cultivating the plants if someone is a patient. This would allow them to do it. So I don't know if language may be specifying if it was in conjunction with the guardian or caregiver could maybe address some of those concerns. Thank you. That incapacitated adult in the current law is able to define somebody that they want to be their caregiver who can grow for them, correct? That's correct, but they cannot access the plants themselves. Only the caregiver can have access to the cultivation site as the law is written. So she can't grow up water the plants? No. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aligned with the intent and concerned about the language, but it, the bill in front of us refers back to a current statutory definition of an incapacitated adult. And that definition says it's a person who lacks sufficient understanding or capacity to communicate responsible decisions. So, again, you know, I, I, that's a, I mean, this is the definition that's used in the Adult Protection Services Act to put a person with mental illness or other disability under guardianship. So, so, I mean, I, I think that the intent of this bill is really good, and I think if we can work this language a little bit, you know, maybe we can get to a place where I'm comfortable, but that definition is really what gives me pause, um, Ms. Lister. So, so um, again, I, I'm, 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 I'm open to suggestions, too, about, about how to fix this, because I, I think I agree with, with what's trying to be accomplished here. Representative, uh, Senator McCormick. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I support both uh, Senator Haskell and Representative Fatine's concerns, uh, and the department as well have indicated this clearly a safety issue. Uh, so to quickly work on the language, I think that would be most appropriate. Representative Sanderson. Could we perhaps have Mr. Um, Albert from the department to come up? Maybe he can share some Thank you, um, information with us. We could address this issue um, and avoid <coughs> the concern of exploitation, which the department very much agree, agrees with. If the um, definition of the closed lock facility, those who have access to the closed lock facility, could be amended to authorize an incapacitated person with, because the regulations already allow for a caregiver to assist an incapacitated person in. in uh, Purpose of cultivating our marijuana, but if we amend the access to the cultivation location to allow the incapacitated person with their caregiver to access the location, the department would not be object, uh, would not object to that. Thank you. With that, um, can we hear from Ms. Lister? With that, she's not would address it as long as they could have access when the caregiver is 
We're going to have a conversation when we come to the mic. <laughs> we thought you were just going to nod I wait to hear you about all the people back home who are eagerly listening in. Thank you. Um, so my only concern with the language proposed is that it would specify the caregiver had to accompany the incapacitated adult into the cultivation site. If, in the case of my mother, she's able to take care of herself on a daily basis on her own you know, when I am gone. So if there's some provision to allow that patient access to the cultivation site without having to be accompanied by the guardian at all times, I don't know if that's possible. I do think that suggestion is definitely the right direction. Sanderson. Would it be trying to find the middle ground here? Because I mean, incapacity, incapacitated adult could go for someone who does have a level of independence, such as Ms. Lister's mother, to someone who is completely dependent upon. And I think those are the individuals who the department is certainly tried to, trying to protect. I'm wondering if there is a way to, without too much complication, find that middle ground to accommodate those folks with a level of independence who still fall under parts of the incapacitated adult definition, but maybe not all. Representative McKean? Yeah. And again, yeah, I, I mean, there's no magic to grabbing the definition of an incapacitated adult from the adult protective statute, right? I mean, I think that, I think what I do is come up with our own definition of what an incapacitated adult is, and and figure it out. Representative Perstein. I have a question here, and it may be for Mr. Albert. And this is not quite incapacitated adult, but it says in 2012 the DHHS made a rule change to prohibit a patient whose physicians have recommended medical marijuana from cultivating their own plant. So you can be incapacitated, but you can't be your own. It's, I'm not quite sure. It seems like if you were a patient, you should be able to grow your own. And if you're incapacitated, you might be able to grow your own too. So I'm not sure what that whole paragraph means. Here. So a significant concern, um, as well, even last year you saw some um, television footage um, of some uh, individuals who were stealing marijuana from a gentleman who was in, in a wheelchair, who was cultivating his own marijuana, so he couldn't protect his crop. Um, he was not incapacitated, he was physically incapacitated, but he was not determined to be incapacitated. The department's concern is if you have an, by definition, an incapacitated individual, they can't protect themselves necessarily from. So while you may be able to grow water the plants, if somebody wants to follow you in there, we're not going to be able to be able to protect yourself or your plants or the crop. And so you've got diversion issues and you've got physical violence issues that the department is concerned about. So, well, I, I get that with the incapacity, but it, this is about patients that aren't it said, made a rule change that prohibited a patient whose physician recommended, right? It didn't say anything about it. The rule change was specifically around incapacity, I can assure you. I'm not sure if this language is incorrect, but I can't even find language you're saying. It was the fourth and tenth paragraph of the testimony. Oh, full of um, Representative Bellamy's testimony, sorry. But that's what it said in the. Representative Sanderson? So a gentleman who's in a wheelchair is someone who commits crime against him, and he's in the wheelchair. So, so as a result of that, he's no longer able to cultivate. So he gets punished. It, it's, I mean, that's kind of how that appears to me. No, no, no. He can still cultivate if he wants to. There's no prohibition against that. You know, he's he can he probably is cultivating. Um, as a matter of fact. Um, but an incapacitated person, by definition, cannot, under the current law, under the current regulation, regulatory scheme, um, grow. But do you agree there may be a different levels of incapacitation? And maybe we should be looking at that? Because there certainly are some individuals who, such in the case of Ms. Lister's mom, is probably capable of tending to and, and taking care of her own plants, um, but is not capacitated, maybe doesn't have the capability to maybe handle her estate issues as is in 
here. I mean, there's a big difference. I, I think that this definition of incapacitated adult is the extreme case. So if a medical provider determines somebody incapacitated, mm -hmm. then they lack the sufficient understanding or capacity to make or communicate responsible decisions. Um, it's not a person in a wheelchair. So, um, so I think this is a this is the extreme definition of incapacitated. So if you, if a medical provider believes that an individual does have capa sufficient capacity to understand um, uh, and make and communicate responsible decisions, then they're not going to determine them incapacitated, and therefore they wouldn't follow the end of this rule. So if the person really doesn't understand. <coughs> and so if Ms. Lister's mother has been diagnosed as incapacitated by a medical provider by the statutory definition of an incapacitated adult, then she would not be able to, without the assistance of a, of a caregiver, cultivate marijuana. Senator Haskell, then representative. Thank you. I, I really like Mr. Albert's suggestion about the access piece. And I wonder hearing, having heard Ms. Lister's concerns, whether you think there's some language that can be crafted that would accommodate that access <coughs> and if so, uh, would you be willing to do it? Sir, so I think that the um, by allowing the incapacitated adult to access the cultivation location absent a caregiver or a, I think it's only a caregiver, but it's also they can use a guardian uh, power of attorney. Um, it creates the same risk um, that the department is concerned about without that. So. Um, I think that um, an incapacitated person should be accompanied when the enclosed lock facility is accessed and then it becomes an, an enclosed unlocked facility um, um, to prevent uh, exploitation. I, I don't okay. see a right. around there. Okay, I see you don't see that. Thank you. Uh, Can I say, Representative Hyman said you were. Yeah, I think I'm just wrestling the incapacitated adult word is, I, 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 there are all sorts of problems and I, I'm not sure how, if, if, I'm not, I don't, if we go through this, you know, in medical, the medical world with capacity and who has capacity and the question is what are you asking the question for, capacity for what? Um, and so I'm not sure, I, I'm, saying it's not an easy word, it's not an easy thing to define, um, but the word incapacitated adult reaches a level that's pretty low level where I think the risk of exploitation would be met. And so I need to find some other language, but I'm wrestling with how that definition could happen. Representative Sanderson? Yeah. Okay. I, I guess I wonder <coughs> one one idea, so if we have the language about uh, incapacitated adult being able to access while well, being accompanied, but then if we also, I mean, I wonder if we put something in there, but essentially if we're talking about, you know, if there was some, if there was a, a, a doctor who was, if there was a medical professional who was willing to sign off that their assessment they got have capacity to do this particular activity. I wonder if, if that's one way, you know, rather than trying to us here try to define different levels of incapacity, if we just let that to the medical professional to to um, to make a determination on. Um, that's just an idea I'm throwing out. Representative Thank you. When I first read this bill, um. The, the, when I think of incapacitated adults, and the reasoning that I originally thought maybe the, the department would get out in 2012 was because uh, they didn't want somebody to be taken advantage of by being a grower, having someone taking advantage of their being able to grow, et cetera, and maybe that's part of it. Um, but the one thing that never occurred to me, and that I'm still having a hard time reconciling my mind around is the fact that um, we're going to do this and, ma and maybe the example is because they, they could be potentially a target 
um, I mean, my goodness, we, it, it just doesn't make sense to me that because someone is, is incapacitated and could potentially be a target for someone stopping by to steal something that, that they should be punished and maybe have something that they really enjoy and is quite therapeutic taken away in maybe some cases. So I'm having a hard time wrapping my head around that. The, the piece I was originally thinking about that maybe someone would be taking advantage of them and their ability to grow a certain number of plants as a patient, that piece I understand. So I, I would really like some more time to work on this because I understand where you're coming from, but I think we need to be clear on exactly what level of incapacitation that this means. And I would just also add that the department's not concerned about cultivating rose bushes here. Okay. So if we want to have therapeutic gardening, I wonder why it has to be marijuana things. Well, if that's their medicine and they're able to do that, if it helps their condition, is my response to that. Um, but, I mean, I mean, think about it. If you have someone who's incapacitated, they could be a target for anything. What about any pharmaceuticals they have in their home, et cetera? Are you going to stop them from going to be able to have the pharmaceuticals in their home and somebody isn't there to watch them? I mean, that opens up a whole broad door of, the, of something that I'm just not comfortable with. Um, so. Additional discussion? Perhaps I have team. Yeah, again, um, I don't think I can support this bill in its current form. If, if, there's a, if, there's, if, if people want to table this and, and look at it, I, 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 I would support that because, again, I think I understand the you know, concern here, and, and I'd like to think there might be a way to to alleviate that concerns. Senator Haskell. Moved and seconded by Chairman. Second. Moved and seconded by Senator Haskell and Representative Sanderson and the site of the table. All in favor of the motion to table, please raise your hand. All right. All opposed? Yeah. Item is table. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll make sure. I'll, I noticed. Yes. I noticed. <laughs> I'll make sure that I'll make sure that in her notes, uh, Annie makes it and puts an asterisk by your vote that it was wrong. Okay. Um, so, seven sixty six. This is an act requiring me medical marijuana primary caregiver cultivating in a residential building uh, to obtain an electrical permit. This bill uh, an act to require a medical marijuana primary caregiver cultivating in a residential building to obtain an electrical permit. This bill amends the Maine Medical Use of Marijuana Act to require beginning January 2nd, 2016, a primary caregiver to obtain an electrical permit from an electrical inspector prior to cultivating in a residential building. Um, the text for this um, bill as proposed is on uh, page eight of the packet. There's a, uh, it's um, under the cultivation of marijuana um, subsection, there's language explaining um, the, the process. And I wanted to also um, make the committee aware that during the testimony, the sponsor said that we may want to amend this bill to require caregivers and or dispensaries when making their initial ap application through the department to demonstrate compliance with um, a section of Title 32. And I saw that there was also um, in this purple packet that I provided attachment number three um, in the letter providing information from the department, there's some proposed language in here as well. 
Um, and so I don't know if the committee would like to hear from the sponsor. Um, I know that he's available here, but uh, if there's any questions. He's only waited around all day. <laughs> Sir, come out with a Thank you. That's a foreign district 25 window. All right. So, okay. So, um, after, after speaking with the folks, um, currently, currently businesses have to um, get an electrical, electrical permit. That's, that's all part of having a commercial business. So, I think that there was some concern, and you might also have this letter, uh, letter sitting here from um, the Department of Professional and Financial Regulation. Right here. So essentially, they talk about you know the, the, the need for an electrical permit already being in, in statute, but they do say that it's probable that some certified medical marijuana growers are unaware of these circumstances. And it says the electrical installations they use are required to be installed pursuant to provisions of the electrical code by an electrician. Um, so they're saying that they'd be happy to work collaboratively with with um, HHS on, on putting these permits out there. So what what HHS has done is, is they've come back and they've, they've figured out how they like to have it within the statute that, you know, and it, it affects two different spots. You can see that they've got it under 22 MRS, subsection 2, 24, 25. Mm -hmm. And that, that seems to be dealing only, only with the cultivators. And then it looks like in another <coughs> section of, of the statute, they have it dealing just specifically with, with the dispensaries. And, and what it would do essentially, or what, what I'm looking at is it would require um, them to, 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 show, to show, a, show a permit you know, before getting their, their identification card or um, their dispensary, dispensary registration certificate. So they're, they're just proposing putting it somewhere else in statute aside from where, where the revisor's office had decided to put it originally. Representative Burstein? Senator, does this mean that, then, uh, say I apply for a permit 